Hi, good morning and welcome everyone. Um, welcome to this Art Talks webinar, the heart of the matter, cardiac amyloidosis. I know this is a subject that impacts many patients and there's real interest in and, and advances in the field. I'm delighted that we have Dr. Kevin Alexander speaking today. He's an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist at the Stanford Amyloid Center. He's a real expert in the disease and he's um, does a lot of research and has published a lot in the area. I'm going to just briefly tell you about the Amyloidosis Research Consortium that puts on this regular Art Talks webinar before I hand over to Dr. Alexander. We will have a question and answer session at the end, so please put any questions in as they arise and we'll address them. And um, I think I can't see it on my screen, so I can't guarantee it, but I think, yes, there is a chat box, which if you have any technical issues, and we'll, I have some of our team behind the scenes and if any technical issues or questions for the art team, you can just put it in the chat and they'll be able to help you out with that. So without further ado, just to move on. The Amyloidosis Research Consortium was founded in 2015 to make a significant impact on the curability of amyloidosis. We do have work in four different areas, improving the speed and accuracy of diagnosis, increasing the understanding of the science, accelerating drug development and regulatory approval, and also reimbursement of effective treatments and also enhancing the care and quality of life for patients. And one of those is producing educational programs and information to help patients understand more about the treatment, about the disease and make treatment choices. So Art Talk falls into this. So without further ado, I'm delighted to, first of all, thank our sponsors for supporting this. And now I'll hand over to Dr. Alexander. Uh, great. Thank you, uh, Isabel, and uh, the Amyloidosis Research Consortium for the opportunity to speak today. Uh, let me upload my slides here. Okay, great. Uh, so hopefully every, everyone can see that. So uh, the title of my talk today is The Heart of the Matter, uh, cardiac amyloidosis. And uh, I intend this to be kind of a broad overview of some of the, I think, key areas in this field and, you know, areas of question. And I hope to leave a lot of time at the end to facilitate a discussion for any questions that you may have, or if there are certain topics that I didn't cover, uh, but you're interested in, I'm happy to, to go into those as well. So these are my disclosures. So this is a rough outline of what I'd like to discuss today. I'm gonna to talk a little bit about what cardiac amyloidosis is and uh, the, the clinical relevance. We'll spend some time talking about the signs and symptoms, which I think is gonna be key to improving disease awareness and getting uh, folks into to see the right people and diagnose uh, faster than we currently do. And we'll also talk about treatments uh, specific for amyloidosis, but also how to manage uh, symptoms, which I think is a equally important uh, pillar for, for taking care of folks with amyloidosis. And then at the end, I'm going to highlight some areas uh, where I think there's a lot of need for, for research and um, you know, organizations like the ARC and others have really led the way in uh, helping to guide some of these areas. So cardiac amyloidosis at a high level view is a collection of diseases of protein buildup. You have a precursor protein that has a normal function in the body, and for a variety of reasons, it can break down, uh, and those breakdown products can be prone to start to clump together, and if that process happens over time, it can lead to the a formation of amyloid fibrils, which are long, rigid rods of protein that the body has trouble breaking down, and when these amyloid fibrils build up in different organs, it can cause those organs not to function uh, as well. And unfortunately, in some cases, that progressive buildup can lead to failure of those organs. Now, there are amyloid disease, there's dozens of amyloid diseases that have been described that can affect virtually any 
just about any part of the body, you know, things like Alzheimer's disease, for example, uh, or an amyl is an example of an amyloid disease that affects the brain. Uh, I'm a little biased as a cardiologist, but I'd also contend that amyloid diseases that end up affecting the heart uh, require particular attention because of the significant symptom burden that they lead to and oftentimes can be fatal if untreated. So it, it really is uh, an emergency or an urgent matter to, to diagnose and treat in many cases. So how does amyloid in the heart uh, lead to symptoms and, and disease? Well, when there's amyloid fibrils that build up in the heart, that causes the heart muscle to thicken over time. And that thickening leads to the heart being stiffer and not functioning as well as it, as it should. And so how we see that clinically uh, can be things like heart rhythm abnormalities. So the electrical system of the heart can be disrupted by amyloid fibrils gradually building up in those spaces. The stiffness in the heart can lead to what's called congestive heart failure. And you know, I, I'll just say now, when you know, I think and a lay audience, when we say congestive heart failure, uh, I think we all obviously need a better term as cardiologists because I think what patients hear, and this is why I, I don't use that when I see folks in clinic, is that the heart's not working at all. And really, it's this is a spectrum of the heart's not working entirely normally, and that can either be kind of mild dysfunction to more severe dysfunction. So along that spectrum, when the heart's stiff and not quite keeping up with what its uh, main job is, which is to provide blood flow throughout the body and oxygen and nutrients, uh, you can get signs of fluid buildup or fluid overload. And that can lead to fluid buildup in the arms and legs. It can lead to fluid, fluid buildup in, in the lungs. And that can lead to a number of symptoms that I'll talk about in the next slide. And then finally, I think that Another thing to highlight about cardiac amyloidosis is that a lot of treatments that we have to take care of people that have other forms of heart disease uh, are actually ineffective or can lead to, to harm in people with amyloidosis. So things like beta blockers and angiotensin receptor blockers, which are very common medications that we use to treat other forms of heart disease, can be ineffective or uh, and, and lead to, to side effects. So it, that also kind of limits some of our treatment options for, for this disease, which I'll get into. So I think a question that comes up a lot when people, uh, patients and family members are initially on their journey of under, learning about this disease is what are the different subtypes of, of cardiac amyloidosis? So the type of amyloidosis is determined by the specific protein that's building up. And over these next few slides, I, I'll talk about the two most common types of amyloidosis. So the first most common type, the most common type of cardiac amyloidosis is due to a protein called transthyretin or TTR as an abbreviation. This, uh, this protein is produced by the liver and transports thyroid hormone and uh, vitamin A throughout the body. It's secreted by the liver. It's something that we all have. Uh, why it breaks down in certain individuals is an active area of research. When a normal copy of the protein breaks down, of the TTR protein breaks down, that's what we call wild-type transthyretin amyloidosis. And this is a disease that we typically see in older individuals. Uh, most people that get this are over the age of 70. And with increasing age, we see this more and more commonly. This is an under-recognized cause of what we call heart failure with preserved ejection fraction. So people that have stiff, heart stiff hearts that lead to, to fluid buildup, this is, this is one of the leading causes, uh, but unfortunately isn't uh, as recognized as it should be. And this type of amyloid tends to build up in, predominantly in, in the heart. There's another type of transthyretin amyloidosis called hereditary, or you might hear variant uh, amyloidosis. And this is when someone's born with a genetic mutation that changes one of the amino acids in the protein. So amino acids are the building blocks for proteins. And one small change in one, in, in one of those building blocks can increase the chances of the TTR protein breaking down and the propensity for forming amyloid. So these mutations can, can uh, lead, increase the risk of amyloidosis, but they don't in and of themselves necessarily mean you'll go on to develop amyloid. So uh, increased risk, but doesn't, if you have a mutation, you, you may never manifest symptoms. And that's one of the challenges is, taking people that have these mutations but don't have symptoms 
trying to figure out who might go on to progress. Uh, in a little bit of contrast to wild type transplant and amyloidosis, this people that have a hereditary form can have a more variable pattern of amyloid buildup. Where some people have buildup in the heart, others can have buildup in the nerves uh, or gastrointestinal tract or a combination of all, all those things. And I think it's important to uh, recognize, you know, particularly as physicians, because uh, as a specialist, you might be focused on one particular area, disease area, I mean, an organ, but it really takes a, a bigger picture view to, to put all the pieces together many times. So the other main subtype of cardiac amyloidosis is caused by a protein called immunoglobulin free light chain. And this is a fragment of an antibody that our immune cells you make to fight off infections. And when these antibodies break down, they can build up in a variety of places. So light chain amyloidosis can affect many organs, uh, including the heart, kidneys, peripheral nervous system, gastrointestinal tract, and can be any combination of, of those things. Uh, when light chain amyloidosis affects the heart, that tends to lead to a more severe uh, form of the disease and can be more rapid in terms of progression. So that's something we, we look at very closely when someone is diagnosed with this condition is what to what degree do they have heart involvement. So with cardiac amyloidosis for ATTR and AL amyloidosis, early and accurate diagnosis is crucial. So if we think about how this disease process works, you have protein production and breakdown, and those breakdown products lead to buildup and that buildup can cause amyloid to build up in organs and cause the organs not to function as well. We're fortunate to have uh, treatments that are effective against ATTR and AL amyloidosis, uh, but they're not interchangeable. So meaning ATTR treatments don't have an effect on AL and vice versa. Second point I would make is that the treatments that we do have for these conditions predominantly work on reducing protein production and or breakdown. So they don't, they work more so upstream in this process and do less to, to affect the amyloid that's already built up in tissue. So if you already have organ damage from amyloidosis, the treatments will help to slow down or halt more amyloid from building up, but not necessarily reverse the amyloidosis in organs. And so that's why we really strive for early diagnosis for, for this condition. Unfortunately, amyloidosis remains under-recognized and we need to do a better job of uh, picking this disease up earlier. Uh, there's been a number of studies that have highlighted this under pattern of under-recognition. Shown here is just one of those studies that we did a few years ago, looking at data from the Centers for Disease Control, uh, where you can look at reporting uh, different diseases on death certificates. In this case, we queried the reported uh, mortality for amyloidosis. And we looked at that reported mortality over time as well as geography, race, and gender. And uh, I'll just highlight some of the geographic data that we, uh, we discovered just to drive home the point of under recognition. So you can see on this heat map that the reported amyloidosis mortality in the areas in red are high, represent higher reported mortality than places in dark blue. And so you can see in the upper Midwest as well as the Northeast that reported amyloidosis mortality is quite a bit higher than it is in say the Southeast or, or even in the West. And so when we saw this pattern, uh, we, you know, it was very striking to us and led to a couple of hypotheses of what might be going on. At uh, first, are there environmental factors in these regions that lead to higher risk of amyloidosis? That's you know, certainly possible. But what we thought was probably more likely the case is the fact that there's an inherent bias to this type of study. In order for uh, amyloidosis to be recorded on a death certificate, the pronouncing physician has to be needs to be aware of the, the disease and be thinking about it when they make that uh, determination of uh, what the cause of death is. And so if you're not thinking about amyloidosis, it's not going to make it onto a death certificate. And so our thought was that these areas that have uh, higher reported mortality are probably recognizing more cases than, than other regions. And so to kind of delve into that hypothesis more, we looked at county level data for reported mortality. And shown here on this slide is what we saw. So these are the top 15 counties in terms of highest uh, reported mortality. And what you can see on the left side is uh, that a lot of these counties cluster around established amyloid, amyloidosis centers of excellence. So 
around you know Rochester, Minnesota, Boston, but in other areas as shown here. And Mayo, you know, I, I think it's no coincidence that Mayo Clinic and Boston University are the oldest amyloidosis center, established amyloidosis centers in this country. And they led, and these are also the areas that have higher reported mortality. And so I think that it this highlights the fact that if you're looking for this disease and you have the resources to screen and rigorously evaluate people, you're going to find more cases. And I would argue that you know the reported mortalities that are seen in these these higher areas are probably similar to what we'd see in in other areas of the country, but it just highlights the the gap in terms of uh, uh, recognition and diagnosis. So uh, I'm going to talk on a few slides about recognizing some of the signs and symptoms of, of cardiac amyloidosis and what you and uh, family members should look out for. So if we think about how cardiac amyloidosis affects the heart, so just as a reminder, this leads to thickening of the heart and stiff, increased stiffness over time, and that can lead to heart rhythm problems and fluid overload. And so how that manifests as symptoms are, are shown on the left. Uh, shortness of breath is a very common symptom. Oftentimes, it initially starts with physical exertion. So maybe you only notice that when you're doing moderate or, or, or more intense uh, exercise, but feel fine at rest. And as that shortness of breath progresses, you might find that with decreasing amounts of activity, uh, you develop shortness of breath. And you can have palpitations, which are sometimes a sign of arrhythmias. You can have signs of leg swelling, which is due to fluid buildup. Patients with amyloidosis can have low blood pressure and that can manifest with lightheadedness when, when standing up or doing other activities. And it can be things like just generalized fatigue. So just not feeling right, maybe not being able to put your finger on the exact uh, cause or symptom, uh, but a nose will change from how you felt before. And chest pain can be caused by a, a number of things, but that's another thing that people uh, can describe. I'd like to highlight though, that cardiac amyloidosis is a systemic disease, meaning that there's a potential that while you'll have amyloid buildup in the heart, and that could be the main symptom, many times patients have other symptoms that are not heart related. And you know this is a busy slide that shows a lot of symptoms from head to toe. My only highlight here is that when we see patients with suspected amyloidosis, it, it, it requires more than just looking for heart symptoms because perhaps gastrointestinal symptoms are more of the driving factor at this point. So nausea, uh, abdominal pain, diarrhea, constipation, maybe the heart symptoms are more mild. And so this, this requires you know, a physician to kind of think about things from head to toe and look at the big picture and have a low threshold to refer to the appropriate uh, specialist if there's uh, symptoms that are being picked up. The, the second point I'll make about non-cardiac symptoms is that they can also precede the cardiac symptoms by a significant period of time. So for example, in uh, ATTR amyloidosis, it's not uncommon to have uh, amyloid buildup in various tendons and ligaments. And that can lead to conditions like carpal tunnel syndrome, rupture bicep tendon tear, spinal stenosis, uh, torn rotator cuffs. And many times these, these orthopedic injuries or symptoms can precede heart symptoms by five to seven years. And a number of studies have, have shown this. And that's probably due to the fact that you, only, you need a relatively small amount of amyloid in these tendons and ligaments to lead to uh, injury or, or pain. whereas for heart amyloidosis, you need to have a lot of buildup in the, in the heart before the heart gets stiff enough to lead to uh, fluid buildup or arrhythmias. And so I think that this is a, a potential opportunity to identify people early when they have, say, carpal tunnel syndrome, but don't yet have signs of heart symptoms and either you know, start early treatment or monitor those patients closely uh, for any signs of heart symptoms down the road. And so uh, our group and a number of other groups have done studies to try to figure out how we can utilize this information about carpal tunnel syndrome, for example, to help promote earlier diagnosis for patients. So in terms of treatment and managing symptoms, I'm going to split that into to two parts. 
The first are treatments that we have that are specific to the amyloidosis disease itself. And then second part, we'll talk about management of symptoms related to heart uh, amyloidosis. So in terms of amyloid specific treatments, this is a high level view of how I, I think about uh, the treatments that we currently have. So I'll draw your attention to the left side of the slide, which highlights some of the treatment approaches, uh, either in clinical use or in research uh, for light chain amyloidosis. So as you recall, light chains are produced by immune cells called plasma cells. And when those three light chains break down, they can form amyloid that builds up in various uh, tissues. So the mainstay of treatment for light chain amyloidosis is to use therapies to remove the plasma cells that are producing the antibodies that are forming amyloid. And so that's most commonly now in the form of chemotherapies that are targeted to uh, removing those immune cells. Another option is stem cell transplantation, uh, which is used in, in, in certain scenarios as well. There's been a lot of interest in figuring out if there's treatments that can work downstream of kind of just shutting off production. So really trying to disrupt amyloid fibrils that are already in tissues. And this is the case for both AL and ATTR amyloidosis that their efforts to try to figure out ways to break up the amyloidosis that's already deposited in organs. And for both ATTR and AL amyloidosis, there's therapies in clinical trial and being studied as well in, at the preclinical stage to try to uh, you know, make get this as a treatment option. For other therapies for ATTR amyloidosis, I'll talk about those a little bit more on subsequent slides, which I think will kind of show uh, the, the mechanism a little bit a uh, little bit more clearly. So, like I said on the previous slide, the pathogenesis of a AL amyloidosis, so you have plasma cells that produce circulatory free light chains, and that leads to uh, breakdown, ultimately the breakdown of the free light chains, and those light chains start to misfold and form long rods of amyloid fibrils. And shown on the right are some of the areas where we can see those fibrils uh, build up. The heart's one of the most common organs, but we also see it in kidneys as well as peripheral nervous system. Shown here are some of the chemotherapy agents that uh, my hematology colleagues would consider for, for treating uh, AL amyloidosis. I highlight in blue daratumumab because that's the first FDA-approved drug to specifically, specifically for AL amyloidosis. And this is an antibody that attaches to the plasma cells and promotes its clearance. Uh, some of the other drugs that you see here are drugs that we know work against plasma cells and other conditions such as multiple myeloma and have been subsequently shown to be effective in uh, light chain amyloidosis. And so there's a number of factors that lead into a hematologist's decision about which drug or drug combinations to use to lower uh, the amount of plasma cells. So in talking about the treatment options for ATTR amyloidosis, I think it's helpful to understand uh, the mechanism of how amyloid builds up. So as I mentioned, transthyretin is a protein that's produced by the liver that transports thyroid hormone and, and vitamin A. It's typically, in its, in, in its intact form, is uh, what we call a tetramer, so four pieces of TTR protein that are bound closely together. And that's what uh, typically, it is in, in, in a healthy individual. For uh, a number of so for a number of reasons, these tetramers can dissociate, so break apart into the individual monomers, monomeric proteins. Now, what leads to that disruption is still incompletely understood. Certainly, people that have a TTR mutation have a higher propensity for these tetramers to dissociate, but there's probably age and uh, sex-related factors as well that can drive dissociation. And this really is the rate-limiting step in terms, in terms of amyloid formation. Once the tetramers break apart, the individual monomers are, are unstable uh, structures. And so they have a higher likelihood of starting to clump together and aggregate. And those aggregates are what ultimately form uh, amyloid fibrils that deposit in, in the heart and other places. So I'm going to talk about the currently approved drug for ATTR uh, cardiac amyloidosis, and that's a drug called tefamidus. It's, it's a 
a medication that we call a, a stabilizer because the way it works is helping to prevent the TTR tetramer from breaking down. So you can imagine that the, the, T, the tefamis is the green dots uh, shown on the slide here, and they're kind of like cement between bricks. It helps to it helps the uh, strengthen the association between the four TTR pieces so that it doesn't, it's less likely to break down into the monomers. And so if you have less breakdown, then you have less formation uh, of amyloid fibrils. So this was studied in a clinical trial of over 400 people who either got tefaminous or placebo. And they looked to see how people did over 30 months. And what you can see here is uh, survival. So people over 30 months, people that are on tefamis were more likely uh, to be alive at, at that two and a half year time point. And you can see that that benefit started to become apparent around 18 months into the study. So it wasn't immediate. Uh, it's, it took time to, to see that, that those two curves separate. And other things that are found from the study were that people that received tefamis were uh, less likely to be hospitalized for cardiovascular uh, issues. They... Uh, their decline in how far they could walk was uh, less compared to people with placebo. And notably, the treatment uh, did not have any significant side effects. So a combination of all those things you know, ultimately led to FDA approval uh, for uh, this drug in ATTR cardiac amyloidosis. I think it's important to highlight when you get into the weeds a little bit and look at the data for certain groups of patients within this study. Uh, one thing that one thing that was shown were that people that had more advanced heart symptoms, so that's highlighted here in red, so class three uh, heart symptoms, um, which is kind of a more severe group of, 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 of patients, uh, did not have uh, the same benefit from tefamis as people that had less uh, severe uh, uh, heart failure. And I think that that kind of goes back to what I showed earlier in the talk, that tefamis is a drug that helps to reduce uh, new amyloid from forming, but doesn't necessarily help to remove, to clear or address the amyloid that's already in tissues. So it's really important to diagnose this condition early and start people on treatment uh, to have the best bang for your buck or effect from, from the therapy. So there are a number of other drugs uh, in development or being studied for ATTR. Uh, some of them have been improved for the neuropathy form of this condition. Um, it, but in terms of what's currently commercially available to FAM, this is the, the only uh, drug. So I'll just highlight the drug classes that are being studied for, for ATTR cardiac amyloidosis, and they really fall into two categories. The first are transthyretin silencers, and these are drugs that work by uh, uh, targeting the liver where TTR is produced and lowering the production of TTR protein, somewhere on the order of 70 to 90 percent, depending on uh, the drug that, that's being studied. And so if you have less TTR being produced, then you have less TTR that can go on to break down and form amyloid. And like I mentioned, there's a few drugs that are currently approved in this class for neuropathy, and we're awaiting the result, trial results for the, this drug class in some in, in heart patients. There's another line of treatments that are looking at uh, breaking down and removing uh, either TTR aggregates or fibrils. Uh, as well as the monomers that have, have broken down. So this works a little downstream of production and really, you know, perhaps is getting somewhat at amyloid that's either uh, formed or about to form. And but you know, we'll see kind of how these show, uh, these bear out in trials, but perhaps a, a complementary treatment to some of these other ones that work really by uh, reducing uh, amyloid, uh, uh, TTR production, amyloid production. So it's important I think equally important to treatments that uh, impact amyloid production are controlling the symptoms that uh, Swan has currently. Because all the amyloidosis therapies uh, are important in reducing amyloid production, but don't work overnight. And the thing that you know, bothers people most is the shortness of breath they have and inability to walk across the room or lightheadedness that prevents, um, prevents you from doing uh, daily activities of living, et cetera. And so those things have to be addressed uh, you know, immediately. And I think in parallel with treating the amyloidosis. So uh, these are some of the things that we think about as cardiologists when we're, we're treating uh, cardiac symptoms. 
So things related to uh, heart rhythm abnormalities. So you can have fast or slow heart rhythms and those can both cause shortness of breath and palpitations and lightheadedness. And um, you can pass out if, if, if you have a, a low blood pressure for a long period, of, extended period of time. And so some of the conditions that are commonly associated with cardiac amyloidosis, one's a condition called atrial fibrillation, where the top part of the heart beats very fast. And that can lead to, uh, that can lead to a lot of symptoms. It also increases the risk of stroke because blood clots can form in the, in the top part of the heart and can break off and go, go to other parts of the body. So uh, we, some of the things that we think about are ways to keep people out of atrial fibrillation. So we, there, we can do electrical shock to get you out of atrial fibrillation, patients out of atrial fibrillation. And there's medications to try to help sustain um, someone out of atrial fibrillation. There's procedures called ablations, which burn small parts of the heart uh, uh, wall to try to prevent atrial fibrillation from coming back. And people that have slow heart rhythms from amyloidosis, sometimes they benefit from a pacemaker that can help to increase the, the minimum heart rate and, and give people a little bit more energy because they have better, better blood flow. In terms of managing fluid overload, there's a, a, a couple of key points. First is that uh, sodium intake or salt intake can significantly increase the amount of fluid buildup or propensity for fluid buildup. And so maintaining a low salt diet is very important. And you know, if you have if you come from having just a high salt diet diet to really cutting down the salt, that alone can be a significant intervention in reducing fluid buildup and improving symptoms. Uh, making sure patients on the right dose of diuretic to really get all of that fluid off uh, is, is key because even having a couple of pounds of extra fluid can can lead to symptoms and, and limit somebody. And then also thinking about other diuretics to add on to kind of our standard big gun diuretics, things like spironolactone and plerinone can help with their diuretic effect, but also might have some secondary benefits in terms of uh, reducing scarring in the heart. Many patients with cardiac amyloidosis can have low blood pressure, and that can be very debilitating uh, if you can't, you can't stand up without getting lightheaded and either passing out or feeling like you're going to pass out. And so if that's a persistent symptom, there are medications that we can use to increase blood pressure and hopefully give people a little bit more ability, more mobility and functionality. I often get asked about, uh, is it safe to exercise and should I exercise? Uh, I think the, the short answer is yes, but, but with caveats. Uh, we know that exercise is, is, you know, the heart is a muscle and, you know, needs to be trained and maintained. And we know that in various types of heart disease that uh, free, regular exercise can improve symptoms and improve stamina. I think the main thing is to uh, build up to it and not overdo it. And this can be, you know, defining what's the right level activity for you can be um, determined with uh, guidance from your physician who um, can kind of speak to your current clinical status. But I think ultimately trying to get folks uh, to, on some exercise regimen uh, will be beneficial in the long run. Sometimes what we, we can refer people to what's called cardiac rehab, which are kind of more structured programs that can help to define um, the amount of exercise that uh, is safe for, for an individual. Another question I get asked um, is what's the role of, of heart transplantation? So uh, at a high level, what I'd say is we consider heart transplantation in individuals where the heart symptoms progress despite amyloid treatment and symptom treatment, and really is, you, is, is, is extremely debilitating. So kind of that you have to be sick enough. Um, but we also look closely at the impact of amyloidosis on other organs, because if there's significant kidney disease, liver disease, uh, neuropathy, the heart transplant won't fix those things. And those other non-cardiac conditions can uh, impact the heart transplant. And so really trying to understand the severity of disease throughout the body is important. Uh, but in people that uh, are eligible for, for transplant and um, you know, is an, appro an appropriate treatment, the outcomes after transplant are similar to those who get transplanted for other reasons. And this is a study that we did uh, at our center at Stanford, but other groups have done studies that have shown similar data uh, that this that the outcomes are, are similar. So it, I think for the appropriate patients, this is something that we that should be considered. 
So in the last few minutes, I just want to highlight some uh, areas of research where I think there, that there's need. And you know, I think um, uh, Isabel highlighted some of this on, on her initial slides. And um, I think there, there's a, a lot of importance in removing barriers to treatment in cardiac amyloidosis. So I showed you some slides of effective treatments that we have that can save lives. Unfortunately, uh, those treatments aren't always delivered to people in a timely fashion, or they might not get them at all. And I think that that we have kind of a, a leaky pipe of attrition in terms of um, uh, um, barriers that limit this. So I think limited disease awareness and under recognition of this condition and high risk groups, diagnostic delays, and then ultimately access to treatment uh, are things that can uh, limit you know, these uh, the effect of these uh, of these treatments. And so I think research into uh, population research as well as implement implementation uh, research are, are needed to uh, improve access to, to therapy. We need more effective treatments that reverse and cure amyloidosis. Uh, you know, like I showed, a lot of these treatments that we currently have help to reduce ongoing amyloid production, but don't necessarily address the amyloid that's already deposited in tissues. And so more th therapies that can reverse that organ injury uh, I think it's going to be key, and there's a you know, number of groups in academia and industry uh, and foundations looking into this. We also need better diagnostic tools to pick this disease up early. Uh, historically, amyloidosis was diagnosed through biopsy, so either uh, skin biopsy, heart biopsy, kidney biopsy, um, which are invasive procedures, but also require the technical expertise to accurately interpret uh, the pathology results. And so like we have for other areas in, in cardiology, uh, I think it'd be ideal if we had uh, blood-based tests or biomarkers that we could use to, to detect the disease early when we have initial amyloid breakdown buildup. And so I think that there's a lot of uh, uh, ways to approach this. And I, I think one of them is to look at uh, the molecular changes in people with amyloidosis. So at the protein level, at the gene level, at the metabolite level, um, at the environmental level, how, how do these things uh, impact protein breakdown and protein buildup in amyloidosis? And can that provide clues to uh, molecules that can uh, be early predictors of signs of, of amyloid breakdown? So that's something that you know, many groups, including mine, are, are interested in, in pursuing. And one thing that comes up in ATTR is how to uh, effectively uh, monitor people that have a mutation. So as I mentioned that there's many TTR mutations and they can increase the risk of developing amyloidosis, but don't, but just because you have a mutation doesn't necessarily mean you'll go on to develop amyloidosis. So I think with wider utilization of genetic testing, either you know, through clinical programs or commercially through things like 23andMe, people are finding that they have these mutations. And the question is what, what's the best way to, to, to monitor them? You know, on the one hand, you don't want to treat everyone that has these mutations because many of them, many people would, would never go on to develop amyloidosis. So committing a young person to lifelong treatment for something they won't get, you know, is not ideal. On the other hand, waiting for you know, someone to develop significant amyloid before starting treatment is not, not great either. So kind of figuring out how we can identify people that are at risk and have the right frequency of monitoring, I think, is, is an important uh, area of research. So in summary, uh, early recognition and treatment are key for cardiac amyloidosis. There are several emerging treatments that have been shown to be infect, effective at improving outcomes. And continued research is needed to improve treatment options and ensure widespread access to uh, appropriate care. So thank you for your attention and happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you so much, Dr. Alexander. That was a really informative talk. We have lots of questions coming in, so I will start right off. We've um, had a couple of questions which are from patients who have had heart transplants, and the question is whether they should continue taking tofamidus. Yeah, so that's a, that's a good question. Um, you know, now that we have treatments that can prevent amyloid from building up like tofamidus, what do we do with them after a transplant? And so, you know, there's, we don't have a lot of data from this. Uh, I'll just start by saying that, you know, a lot of the experience we have is from the, you know, the small number of patients at our individual centers and 
you know, my colleagues at other transplant centers, um, and I talk about this a, a fair amount, uh, I'd say without a doubt that the signs of ongoing or recurrent amyloidosis should be monitored in transplant patients. So, so signs of neuropathy, um, recurrent heart symptoms should be monitored for closely. Um, and if those things are present, uh, treatment certainly makes sense. I think in terms of uh, using tofam to say in a preventative fashion, we we don't have the the data just yet for that. And so, you know, I'd say you know my in my practice, I don't uh, routinely put everyone on tofamidus after transplant. We just do rigorous uh, monitoring. And I think the important thing to to note is uh, amyloidosis is a disease that particularly transplant retina is a disease that uh, over many years in terms of the protein buildup. So it's not something that happens uh, overnight. And so as long as someone's being followed closely, I, I don't. I think it's unlikely to be a scenario where some, you have significant am, irreversible amyloid buildup. Excellent. And there's sort of a related question if we're talking about tofamidus is um, somebody has commented on the high cost of tofamidus and whether diflunazole is an option that's worth considering. Um, could you discuss that a little bit? Sure. So I think for, for the audience, um, uh, so diflunazole is another drug that is a TTR stabilizer. Uh, so it works in a similar fashion to, to FAMIS. It happens to be a non-steroidal, uh, so kind of like ibuprofen that people later discovered has stabilizing properties. And so from a cost standpoint, it, it's relatively uh, cheap. So uh, in terms of use of diflunazole, well, before Tefamis came out, you know, many, of, many of my colleagues and myself used diflunazole uh, to treat patients. And um, so it, it, is, it is effective. I, I would say from, you know, when cost of the barrier to FAMIS is not um, accessible, then uh, I think it can be an option. The main things with diflunazole are side effects related to non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs in terms of higher risk of stomach ulcers and um, uh, kidney issues, which sometimes are, are problems for our, our heart failure patients. So I'd say in select cases, uh, it's something to con consider. I'm hoping that as with these, with these trials, coming uh, ongoing and hopefully more treatments become available that will have a net benefit of uh, driving down costs for these drugs so that they're more uh, things are more available to everybody. Mm -hmm. Here's another question. Since ATTR can cause AFib, why do a cardioversion or an ablation when the cause can't be addressed? Well, so I would say, so in terms of cardioversions and ablations, the success rates, long-term success rates are lower than say other causes of AFib. Um, but there are people that can have sustained uh, benefit from a cardioversion or ablation, you know, in combination with medications to help you know, keep out of atrial fibrillation, uh, particularly if, if it's in an earlier stage of disease. So, you know, I, I would say my general approach is if someone has significant amount of symptoms from atrial fibrillation, it's worth a, a try to, to get, get someone out of atrial fibrillation and try to keep them out, um, knowing that you know, for, for some people, ultimately you can't keep them out of atrial fibrillation long-term, but I think it's, it's oftentimes worth, worth a try. And we've got had a couple of questions about what, what really is ejection fraction? How does it impact a patient? What are the symptoms from it? And also like what, when is it, should it be of concern? Yeah. So I would say, so ejection fraction is a measure of how much blood the heart squeezes with every beat. So um, for a normal person, the ejection fraction is between 55 and 65%. So meaning every time the heart beats, about 65% of the blood gets pushed um, uh, through the, the aorta. Uh, so it gives us one piece of information about heart function. Now I'll, I'll preface this and say that it's one number. So meaning that it in and of itself um, is a helpful piece of information, but there's so many other factors that go into an individual person and, and their clinical status. So um, with, with uh, lower ejection fractions, you, you associate that with uh, worsening heart function, but there are people that have low ejection fractions who are quite functional and active, and there are people that have normal ejection fractions and um, are more limited by their heart. And so that just kind of reflects the fact that there's other things about the heart that can impact uh, its function. And so I would say I wouldn't worry specifically about a certain number, but more about how 
someone's doing in terms of how far they can walk, what you know, physically you're able to do, it's more more important to me than uh, the specific number. So once amyloid fibrils are deposited in the body, do they ever dissolve or disappear naturally? Yeah, that's a good question. So uh, the I guess the short answer is the, the body has some, there's evidence the body has some innate ability to clear amyloid fibrils, but that ability uh, is relatively modest, meaning that the, the, there probably is a small amount of clearance over a long period of time. Now, what oftentimes is the issue is that the production of amyloid far outpaces that. So if you're removing this much amyloid, but you're producing this much, the net benefit's gonna be, the net result of that's gonna be accumulation. And so, um, you know, I think there's nice data from the UK group and that used, when they used uh, serial MRI and showed that in people with AL amyloidosis who have achieved complete remission, so the light chain production is shut off completely, um, you can look at MRI and, and see over time that there's signs of resolution of, the, of that amyloid, but we're talking over, you know, one to two years type of time frame, not weeks or months. Um, so I, I think that if, if you can effectively lower t uh, amyloid production uh, low enough, then, then it's possible to have some clearance through your body's innate mechanisms. Uh, that also, also being said though, I think some of the treatments that are looking at uh, fibril disruptors, hopefully if they're effective, can accelerate that clearance process. So there's a few questions that we've had around diagnosis and some patients who've had a cardiac biopsy that was positive and a fat pad biopsy that was negative or a biopsy from other areas. And also given um, PYP, somebody here who had a positive MRI and blood tests, are biopsies necessary? What type of biopsy should be done? What's the, and, and I know you touched on this a while in your talk about the challenges of diagnosis and no single pathway, you know, complexities around that that patients experience. Sure. So uh, I would say that, so in terms of diagnosis, biopsy is still the gold standard in terms of um, accuracy. And typically where to biopsy from, you can imagine that um, that place where what's driving the symptoms is probably the, the place of highest yield for biopsy. So meaning if you have cardiac symptoms, the cardiac biopsy it will have the most sensitivity for picking up amyloid. If there's kidney issues, kidney biopsy, et cetera. Um, you know, those are certainly invasive procedures. Um, it's more than just an imaging test, right? Uh, and so that's what we have to balance is, you know, the need for kind of getting that um, accurate diagnosis versus the, the the um, uh, procedural risk. Uh, fat pad biopsy can be kind of an intermediate where you get biops, you get biopsy information, but you know, and, and many times the sensitivity for that is lower than directly biopsying, say the heart or, or kidneys. So there, uh, there can be scenarios, and I, I see this you know, fairly commonly where the fat pad biopsy is negative, but then the heart biopsy uh, shows the amyloidosis and what type. So typically at our center, we will biopsy the organ that we, you know, we, um, where it seems like there's the most involvement rather than uh, pursuing a fat pad biopsy. Uh, when can uh, non-biopsy pathways be used? So for ATTR, the pyrophosphate scan can be uh, used to diagnose ATTR in, in lieu of a biopsy. The main caveat there is that technician pyrophosphate scans can occasionally be positive in light chain amyloidosis. And so it's important to rule out the presence of light chain amyloidosis before doing a pyrophosphate scan. And we do that by measuring for, for light chains in, in the blood. And so if those hematologic tests are negative, you can interpret a positive pyrophosphate scan as being due to ATTR. You know, fortunately, sometimes what happens are people do have abnormal light chain levels and get the pyrophosphate scan. And a positive study in that case, you're kind of left in this scenario where a good chance that it's ATTR, but there's a small chance it could be AL and that has huge implications because they're treated completely differently. They're the, uh, how aggressive they are is also different. Uh, so in those cases where um, you do have abnormal light chains, uh, then you need to get a biopsy instead of a pyrophosphate scan to one, confirm the presence of amyloid and two, to be certain about what type of amyloidosis you're dealing with. All right, so this nicely segues into the next question, which is, 
Although very rare, though somebody um, has posted here and we do hear about it, they have co-commission AL and wild type. How do you address the treatment? Is one treated or another? How is that managed? Uh, sure, yeah. I mean, I've seen that uh, only a few times. Uh, and that's why you know, biopsy kind of, you know, uh, back to that prior kind of biopsy is still kind of the gold standard. So if, if there's any kind of uncertainty, um, biopsy can help to kind of identify these rare scenarios such as concomitant uh, amyloidosis. Uh, AL amyloidosis is, tends to be more aggressive than wild type ATTR. And so I think that that should be kind of the uh, one to prioritize. Uh, but, you know, right now our, our treatment for, for wild type is tefamidus, and that's a, a pill that doesn't really have many drug interactions. So there's no issues kind of giving that concomitantly. Uh, but even if you were to kind of focus on the AL treatment um, initially and then start to fan this uh, a little bit later, that probably wouldn't make a, a too huge of a difference. You know, like the uh, to famous trial I showed you, those benefits from to famous are seen uh, over many months. It's not not immediate. So, um, yeah. And here's a question that somebody has a parent of Caribbean descent whose father had hereditary and mother wild type. What's your recommendations for monitoring the offspring ranging in range currently from 50 to 67? So I think that's, that's an interesting question. Um, so I'll hand over to you. Yeah, so I, I think for people that have first degree relatives, so parents, siblings um, with a hereditary ATTR uh, mutation, the question comes up of, genetic testing um, and the other family members. And you know, the first thing I'd say is, I think it'd be reasonable to, to explore that question. And I would suggest being referred to a licensed genetics counselor, genetic counselor to kind of go over um, the implications of genetic testing and what, what's involved there. Um, and so kind of in, in, dis in discussion with that genetic counselor and your physician, you can decide if genetic testing is, is right for you and what the, what the timing is. I would say that you know, for something like V122i, which is the, the variant that's uh, seen in people uh, in black individuals, that's a disease that tends to affect people in their 50s to 70s. So you know, if you're someone in your 40s, for example, it might be reasonable to, to do genetic testing because you're kind of you know, approaching that age where you would uh, expect to see uh, amyloidosis. And so the genetic testing there, if you have the variant, then um, you, know, you can see an amyloidosis specialist who can monitor for signs of neuropathy and cardiomyopathy through things like echocardiogram and you know, uh, serial physical exams. Uh, for people that are much, much younger, so let's say 20 or, or, or even children, I, I don't, uh, I think that I would do genetic testing with caution in those groups because you know, you're talking about a disease that wouldn't, even if they have the mutation, um, wouldn't necessarily affect them for many decades, right? And so um, I, I think that you know, it wouldn't change anything immediately. And there's also kind of you know, implications with genetic testing and you know, having that, that diagnosis. So you know, I think the timing of testing really is a little nuanced, uh, but in general, I think people are approaching the age where they might manifest with the disease is kind of the group that I would think about testing in. Mm -hmm. And does the couple of questions around um, beta blockers, are they, is it something you should take or not with cardiac amyloid and also about what medication for high blood pressure is safe to take? So beta blockers, uh, so the benefit of beta blockers say in other forms of heart failure uh, you know, is, is well established. Uh, we don't have that data for cardiac amyloidosis that there's that same benefit. So, you know, I think a scenario that happens a lot of times when I get someone referred to me, they've been on a variety of heart medications for, for years and were diagnosed with amyloidosis. Um, I don't immediately stop medications. It really depends on uh, how the patient's feeling. So if, you know, blood pressure is fine, there's no symptoms of lightheadedness, dizziness, then I think it's fine to continue them. But if things change down the road, we're now starting to get lightheadedness or increasing fatigue or blood pressure is lower, I would you know, either reduce the doses or, or stop them. So, you know, kind of that second question of what's safe for high blood pressure. Well, the blood pressure is high. I think you can still use, you know, 
these drugs like angiotensin receptor blockers, for example, uh, but just use them with caution, maybe you know, increase them a little bit more slowly, given that there's a possibility that you could have uh, a more uh, robust blood pressure response to, to starting these things. Thank you. And there, um, a couple of questions have also come in about, is there an age limit for heart transplants? Uh, age, it, it's kind of a decision of individual transplant centers. Uh, you know, I would say that you know, we don't have a hard and fast cutoff, but at the same time, you, we, we look at all the things that uh, can impact the, uh, you know, how people do after the transplant. So having you know, significant kidney disease, liver disease, um, frailty, these, these things uh, are, are things that we consider, and those things tend to worsen with age. And so I would say that these other you know, non-cardiac conditions are things that we look at closely uh, in conjunction with age, but um, we don't have a specific cutoff. So there are quite a number of questions about when will some of these new therapies be available to patients? And maybe it would be a good last question to just spend a little time talking about what the future looks like. And I know you've, you've touched on that, but also maybe touch on how, where we are and how long it takes for drugs to become available to patients and what your sort of thoughts are on that. Sure. Uh, so I'll start with the last question first. Uh, so in terms of drug development and clinical trials, uh, so you, things are tested in the lab. So in test tubes, cells, animal models, and when there's kind of promising leads for a treatment for disease, in this case, amyloidosis, uh, that will lead to what's called an early phase trial or phase one trial, where you look at that drug in either healthy volunteers or people uh, or a small number of people that have the disease, and you're, you're look, looking to see if there's any significant side effects, trying to help to determine, um, you know, if, if there's any signs of uh, effect. And then if there's promise there, that leads to a little bit larger study, a phase two study, or now you look at a, a little bit larger number of people, say 50 to 100, and you're looking again at safety and also kind of trying to determine what dose of drug might be the most effective. And if that all looks good, that will um, lead to a phase three trial, which is the big kind of trial of hundreds or sometimes thousands of people where you're looking at this drug compared to placebo and trying to understand, does this drug help save lives? Does it help reduce hospitalizations? Does it help people feel better? All those things that you know everyone ultimately cares about. And if that um, is po a positive study, then that can lead to approval of the drug for use. Um, so that pipeline can take you know, five to 10 years, depending on what, what's being studied. Um, I think in amyloidosis, there's things all along that pipeline from preclinical in phase one to things that are in phase three that are imminently, we're waiting for the results. Uh, and one of those is um, the Apollo B trial, which is a drug, study a drug called Patisaran, which is one of the silencers that, uh, in the silencer class that I mentioned earlier, so a drug that lowers TTR uh, levels. It's currently approved in people that have neuropathy, and this study is looking at how it performs in people that have uh, ATTR cardiomyopathy. So in the coming weeks uh, or you know months, uh, we'll have results of that. And so if that's a positive study, then that can lead to um, uh, potentially lead to FDA approval, another therapy we have for for cardiomyopathy. So you know I think stay tuned for that, and you know we'll see kind of what happens over the next several months. Um, in addition to that study, there's a number of phase three trials that are ongoing, looking at other silencers, uh, for example, in ATGR cardiomyopathy. And so those are either finished enrolling or in the middle of enrolling. And so those will be ongoing over the next you know, couple of years and we'll, we'll see what those show. But I think that you know it, this went from a disease where we didn't have anything in, in, in late stage trials to having several things uh, in late stage trials, as well as things that are earlier in the pipeline. So I think that holds a lot of promise. Yeah, and I think that's a, an optimistic note to end on. We're seeing so many developments in the field and initiatives to raise awareness for earlier diagnosis and seeing the impact of that and more patients being diagnosed earlier on in their, in their disease. And um, really a, a large number of companies that have uh, studies ongoing. And so I think there's a really bright future for 
patients with amyloidosis. And um, I want to thank you so much for speaking today. It was really a great talk, very educational, informative. There are a lot of patients who attended and we've had well over a hundred questions that were written in a question and answer box. We've answered as many as we could in the time we had. And for um, those that haven't been answered, we will take those unless you were anonymous, in which case we won't be able to get back to you, but feel free to email us your questions at arc at arc.org. But we will, over the next couple of weeks, we'll make sure to answer your questions and um, get back to you. And there also were quite a few questions about, please, can I watch this again? So this will become available as a resource on our website. If you're signed up for the ARC newsletter, you will get a note letting you know when that's happened. Thank you, Dr. Alexander. This was really an excellent talk um, and really helpful to hear. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me. Really appreciate it.